But I'll listen to it anyway. Everyone, this is the director's commentary for the 2019 version of The Lion King. All the rest of these were created, actually. Uh, the environments were created by MPC, which is the, the one vendor that, that worked on this. MPC. Of, of houses. The one that closed their Vancouver studio. Oops. Even though clearly everything's animated here, there's nothing live action. The environments aren't, the, the characters aren't. Everything is handmade, hand animated. Yeah, it's weird because, like, he says, he, this is, he recorded this commentary before it was even premiered, right? But surely there was some backlash online that he must have seen of how the film looked. So it's really weird that he's constantly, through all these interviews and this commentary, saying like, oh yeah, we want it to, it to look like a documentary, as though that's a point towards the film and not against it. Like, he's, he's listing people's criticisms as though they're benefits towards the film, and it's so strange. He's literally just, like... Everybody was already saying, like, yeah, it looks like a shitty documentary. Like, no one who wants to see a, a movie, an animated movie that looks like a fucking documentary. Like, it looks so boring. Like, people people were making fun of it, saying it looked like a National Geographic documentary. And yet here he is saying, like, yeah, I wanted it to look like a documentary. And, like, not thinking that there's anything wrong with that. And it's very strange. All the ways they brought emotion, anthropomorphic emotion to these naturalistic... Uh, animals, these, these animals that didn't have any expression. <laughs> he almost called them characters and then said animals instead. I'm not uh, being tempted to make them act in too much of a cartoony fashion and break the, the illusion that we were really photographing this. It's so stupid. He doesn't understand that that's like a bad idea. <laughs> but this movie made a shit ton of money, so whatever, I guess. Do you remember from the old film? He was painting. We felt that Rafiki would very easily turn and Oh my god, this 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 line is uh, oh, what he says here is just so stupid. It was a, a difficult conundrum because if you remember from the old film, he was painting. And we felt that Rafiki would very easily turn anth anthropomorphic and it would blow the illusion of him being a real a real primate if we had him painting. What? And so the idea of these bugs magically they kind of, talk. Uh, coming together and him nudging them to create some kind of a, a holdout for blowing pigment onto the tree. Kind of like the old uh, cave paintings where ancient humans would hold their, their hand up against the cave wall and blow pigment against it and, and, and remove their hand and there'd be the outline. He just he keeps justifying these things in ways that don't make any fucking sense at all. He said he didn't want to anthropomorphize Rafiki, but then doesn't he say something about him, them wanting to anthropomorphize here? All the ways that they brought emotion, anthropomorphic emotion, to these naturalistic uh, animals, these, these animals that didn't have any expression. We wanted to limit the, the scope as much as we could to, to the naturalism of the animal's behavior. And so, uh, borrowing a lot and learning a lot from the techniques that are used in documentaries, we were able to... So uh, he wanted to do it through, like, the filming the techniques, but not the characters, which is just so weird to say. Why? Why, like, why even have them talk? If you wanted to make a nature documentary... And every bit of emotion is through the filming techniques and not the actual characters. Why didn't you just fucking get David Attenborough or whatever? And like, yeah. And just get him to narrate. And then the animals don't talk or sing. Or David sings. And again, really no emo emotion in the face. Which is uh, counterintuitive if you're doing a film like Lion King where you want the animals to express a lot of emotion. And so it fell upon the voice cast. He's literally just saying it out loud. It's so weird. So I think there's a really good sense of weight how the camera characters move. And again, really no emotion in the face, which is uh, counterintuitive if you're doing a film like Lion King where you want the animals to express a lot of emotion. And so it fell upon the voice cast. In this case, it's J.D. McCreary and Shua Telegy for to bring a lot of performance through and emotion through their voices. And also the camera work. So you see a shot like this where you start off on a close-up of Simba. And then you see the camera slowly move and the, and the focus rack. And so even though there's no expression on Scar's face, you definitely read a lot <laughs> into what he feels about his little nephew. And look at that beautiful environment. This is a you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about. What? It's just a tool, and it's the artist and the experience of the filmmakers. Uh, the well, yeah, he literally said it was, like, counterintuitive to do that in a film like Lion King. And then he's like, yeah, but the voice performances are so great. Yes. And the camera work, they all make up for it. You can't tell what they're thinking at any given moment, but... Since the vocal performances were just so good, and the camera work is so good, it doesn't matter. Like, what? You you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, people who design environments, yeah, all, this, all the people who are... are all... Feels great. <laughs> that lioness picking up the cub actually looked like shit. Look at that again. Holy shit, looked so bad. And the, the experience of the filmmakers, uh, the cinematographer. Yeah, it is really weird. And the, the experience of the filmmakers. Yeah. Uh, 
It's like clearly not actually biting it. Of the filmmakers. One of the last sequences to be finished. You have a... Uh, I love this type of lighting too. This I like how he doesn't talk about how they originally weren't even going to have the song at all. Because that was like a news thing, right? And now he says this was one of the last sequences to be finished. So it kind of fits. I need to look up those articles. And how you know, how the, the earth is colored there and how it... You know, it's still graphic, but still accurate to, to what is really... Yeah, so this is in my notes. Like, this is... It's so clear that, like... To John Favreau, emotional resonance is coming purely from the technical aspects of the film, and that's it. Like, he's like the glow of the fur. There's so much emotion here. Like, listen to listen to him talk about it. this. is ridiculous. Environment designers or layout artists or animators, people, uh, technical directors overseeing the rendering, people refining the lighting. Each of these is a handmade shot. In this moment, and. Just the, um, the human emotion in, in these this sequence right here, the struggle to climb up the hill and how the rocks tumble down and how the light, the backlight makes the, the fur glow. And and how how the, the earth is colored there and how it, you know, it's still graphic but still accurate to, to what is really there. The what do you mean how the earth is colored there? What, how does that bring more? What? There's no, emo what emotion? If this was like slightly lighter or darker, it would be less emotional. What do you mean? What about the color? There's nothing about it. If like if it if it did some weird shit and like suddenly the whole earth turned blood red or something, then I could see what you were talking about. But this like I don't know what you're talking about here. What about the color of the earth brings more emotion, John Favreau? And this moment and just the um, the human emotion in in these this sequence right here, the struggle to climb up the hill and how the rocks tumble down and how the light the backlight makes the the fur glow, and and how how the, the earth is colored there and how it. You know, it's still graphic, but still accurate to, to what is really there. The way the camera's moving around, the emotion in, in the face of the little of, of young Simba. In the face! He, he, he can't frown, even though he can't make a face to see so much expression. And, and of course, the music. You realize that this is a really supremely human medium. What are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about, John. What do you mean? And I love how he says Simba's face, too. Of the struggle up the hill and how the rocks tumble down and how the light, the back face of the little of, of young Simba. Even though he, what he emotion frown. in the face of young Simba? What? What is th what is this? He's bored. <laughs> like he looks bored. Uh, duh. It looks like he, it looks like he just found like a mouse or something here. Like what? But, oh, what's over there? You know, it's what still... emotion in the? F what are you talking about, John? What the fuck are you actually talking? How can you say that out loud? The music. You realize that this is a really supremely human medium. What are you talking about? What are you actually fucking talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about, John. <laughs> and of course, because it's it's, it's. so. So what I don't fucking understand is that like every single time Hans Zimmer talks about the remake score, he acts as though he didn't have enough people, and that he on the original and was like. Man, I just wanted, like, a more full sound. And, I, I, like, I've already gone through the footage of them having five drum kits for no fucking reason. And I guess you can kind of tell that in here with the beat. Like, what an, what an obnoxious fucking beat this is now. But anyway, what I don't understand about this is, like, if you listen carefully, he actually removed some instruments, which kind of defeats his argument about, like, wanting to just add more to it so like I, I i what so you hear you hear the triangle in the original you hear the here i'll i'll, I'll let you know where it is you hear that there's a triangle there's a triangle in the original and i like it if there's nothing wrong with a triangle does it feel perhaps like like it's a bit dated in the sense that people don't use triangles as as much in in uh in music like that 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 like yeah it's there and then in the 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 remake it's like why isn't it there why isn't it there why did you remove the triangle what kind of justification do you have for that like it's a tiny thing but what was wrong what you're implying something was wrong with having a triangle in it like the music was the the best shit <laughs> that <laughs> you've probably ever written. 
Like it's what it, it, the soundtrack to this film was like record. It might have been record breaking. I don't know, but like it, it was. I think it was the highest selling soundtrack of the year for sure. Perhaps even the decade. I don't know. Um, but like it, you are respected so much for this original work. Why? Are you changing it in ways where you're actively removing parts of it as though those were mistakes? You didn't accidentally put someone in the orchestra or the mini band or whatever you had in the 94 version. You didn't accidentally throw a triangle player in there. You didn't accidentally put that instrument in. So why are you removing it in the remake when your justification for the remake is that you wanted to add more to it? Is that you didn't have a, a big enough orchestra the first time? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. But the Disney tradition is also uh, something that feels like it's, you know, that, that, that was part of something, <laughs> to something even larger. You can't. Part of why it holds up so well. And of course, the stage production has been, you know, drawing audiences and packing houses for. So, now. so in this one, Zazu's here, <laughs> and he wasn't in the original. He was like way over there, but now he's over here. And the reason why is because they changed it. And John doesn't even mention this. They changed his justification when Scar comes back. He's like. I didn't make it to the gorge in time. And then I guess they realized, oh, wait, if Zazu was there, he would probably just say, like, you're lying. I was at the gorge and you you were there before. So literally the only thing preventing all these lions for finding out, from finding out that Scar killed Mufasa and potentially Simba, the only thing preventing every lion from figuring that out is literally just Zazu being over there or them talking about it once. Even when he, like, he clearly goes back after he's sitting with Rafiki there. If if in this entire however many years for Simba to grow up, if all they did was just mention it once to Zazu at all, then they would know. <laughs> but I guess that doesn't happen. He's the big guy around. And he tries to be pushy, but he's too little. And also because he's so little, it gives you permission for him to be a little more aggressive and, and uh, get away with something that, uh, you know, would bump a little more. Uh if the bigger character was doing it, but this little guy is, <laughs> he's all tough. He's a little powerhouse. And there's a look, and this was inspired by uh, um, James Chinlin. Felt that the so yeah, he's literally talking about how he, he anthropomorphized Timon more because it adds to the character. Unless he says it even more here. This might have been the one from my notes. It's just like, well, why didn't you do that with Scar? Long live the king! Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. Special shout out goes to my $5 patrons, Eman7Blue, Tequila Cinema, and Pit Wang. Thank you very much for supporting this channel, and I'll see you next time.